teaching in person and everything. So I feel like this is the next best thing here. Um, so really, we're going to do this every Wednesday for the next couple months, and I'm going to go over a bunch of stuff throughout the next couple months. So this one is really about basic essential bag making tools. And the next time I do, well, we have a whole list of them on our site, but I'm going to go over particular, like I'm going to spend a whole hour on rivets pretty soon. And then I'm also going to go over how to make your own leather straps and yeah, just a bunch of different things that y'all can learn about tools. Because one of the things about bag making is it is so tool heavy. And as you know, we really like the right tool for the right job. But I thought it would be nice to jump on today and tell people what we actually think are essential tools and which ones that we think you can get away with not getting. Because I know it can get pretty pricey to go ahead and um, buy every single tool. So let me go ahead and find my assistant Ellen really quick, make her a co-host, and then she can um, manage the chat and everything. And the um, Zoom itself is being recorded right now too, and it will be available later in case people miss it. So one second here. Okay. So Ellie, I'm here. I okay. signed back in to my personal email, but it's still calling both of us Clumhouse. So mm -hmm. I'm in host and I can manage the chat, which is great, but we might not be able to get your overhead camera okay, going. Fine. So we might have to make do without it. That's fine. Yeah. Great. Okay. And it's recording and we're good. Yes. Great. We're all good. I'm going to close my chat so that I can see better. All right. So let's go over. Um, oh yeah. One more thing. I'm just going to check my notes. Um, we are uh, asking, we're saying that these are free to, and this is just free education and a community service. Um, obviously, we love connecting with you and love you showing up and everything, but we're asking if you want, you can pay it forward to um, the Love Lounge Foundation, which is founded by Rachel Cargo, and they're doing really amazing work supporting mental health and well being of Black women and girls. Um, so we'll drop the link in the chat. And then let's get on to talk about our favorite bag making tools. And if you have any questions at all, Ellen will be monitoring the chat and she can let me know those questions and I can address them um, throughout the hour. Let me just introduce Ellen really quick so that you all can just um, put a face to the name and know who will be talking uh, with you as I'm doing this demo. So Ellen, can you spotlight yourself? Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Maybe you have to do it for me. It's not giving me the option. Okay. Well, I don't even see you on here. So I'm a, I'm Clumhouse co-host right now. So it's not, it's not Ellen. Okay. I still can't see you. Well, I guess you can talk and at least tell everyone. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's not letting, not letting me do it. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Ellen and I am the marketing director at Clumhouse. So I'm the one generally behind our social media accounts and our newsletter and blog posts and things like that. And um, I will be moderating today's talk. So I'll be keeping an eye on the chat, um, which you can access on the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little chat icon. If you click on that, it'll open a chat. Um, window on the right side of the screen and at any point during today's talk if you have a question you can feel free to drop it in there oh I found it. <laughs> um, yeah feel free to drop your questions into the chat and I will be keeping an eye on them and I'll be um, communicating them to Ellie throughout the hour so she can answer all your questions great thanks Ellen There you go. You're back. Oh, great. Were you able to spotlight me? I was able to do that, but not myself for some reason. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, so let's go over some basics about bag making. First of all, it's different than other types of sewing. So even if you've sewn for a while and you are considered consider yourself um, not a beginner, 
then there's a lot of tools and a lot of techniques with hardware and leather and just different types of sewing techniques that are not as familiar as say when you're garment stitching. So I'm going to go over some of that stuff. One of the things that's difficult with sewing and finding skill levels is there's so many different routes you can go to really dig into a certain genre of sewing. So you might be really good at garment sewing, but have never made a quilt or really good at quilting, but have never tailored something. So that's true for bag making too. Get bag making has a lot more industrial type equipment, even though you can totally make bags on a home sewing machine. All of our patterns and kits are designed to be made on a home sewing machine, even the most rugged one like the Slab Town Roll Top Backpack. Our favorite home sewing machine to use is a heavy duty singer. So that is this machine here. And I know that folks that have been around Clumhouse for a while know about this machine. The reason that I like to recommend this machine is it doesn't have a really high price point. I know a few years ago it was retailing around 130. It might be retailing a little bit closer to 180 or 200 now. I don't know, I haven't bought one in a while, but it's called a Singer Heavy Duty. And the heavy duty really stands for the motor being a little bit more robust, having a little bit more power, and also being a little bit faster so that it can really pull some heavy duty fabric through in multiple layers through. There's a bunch of other heavy duty machines and they range in prices all over the place. The second um, most common heavy duty machine that I work with is the Janome HD series. So the HD stands for heavy duty and they come in the 1000 or the 3000 and those are great too and they have really strong motors and a lot of metal parts so that's one of the basics about bag making is we tend to work on heavy duty machines now having said that there's a lot that you can do on a non-heavy duty machine as long as you set your machine up for success including using the right needles and the right thread so I'm going to just talk about like my top 10 favorite sewing tools for bag making. And then we can also talk about my number one um, tools for rivets and stuff like that. But at a future lunchtime live, I'm actually going to have a whole hour where I talk about rivets. So right now I'm really just touching on the essentials. So this is a really great lunchtime live talk if you're a beginner or just getting into bag making. So I mentioned needles and now my favorite needles to make bags with are jeans, chrome, Schmetz needles, and I tend to just use the size 100. And the reason is it's just, just really versatile and I work with a lot of wax canvas in canvas and the weights of the fabric that I'm generally sewing are anywhere from eight ounces to 12 ounces. So I feel like I can get through multiple layers of fabric really well with these. And the chrome professional grade needles just last a little bit longer. They stay sharper for longer. So as you know, and maybe you don't, but it, I always like to say this is change your needle really often. So some people change it every project and that might not be you, but as you know, if you can sew with a strong, with a sharp needle that's not bent, then you're going to get better stitches and your machine's going to last a lot longer. So these are my favorite, um, jeans needles to use. Now I know there's other projects that we have where we use other types of needles like top stitching needles. But again, I just really wanna go over the basics. So if you're just gonna buy one type of needles for bag making, then this would be what I would get, okay? The second thing I get a lot of questions about is what type of thread to use on bag making, which is kind of funny in a sense that I am just so basic and versatile, but my favorite bag making thread is just all purpose thread. So this is a Guterman 100% um, poly all purpose thread. And it's just so strong and it lasts for a long time. And Guterman thread is really nice too because it's not super fuzzy. So unlike some other types of thread brands, this won't um, get a lot of fuzz and dust into your machine when you're running the thread through your machine. So it'll help your machine's gears last longer too because you won't have to clean them as much. So not that we're ever opening our machine and cleaning the gears anyways, but when you take it in for the, its yearly maintenance, which we all do that, right? Then it's just nice to not have all that extra dust um, 
in the gears. Okay, so this is just a really nice thread to use and it's simple, it's all purpose. So a lot of people ask me, oh, well, why don't we use top sh stitching thread all the time? And the thing is, this top stitch is finicky. So not all sewing machines love it. And when you run it through the top, you still need to run an all purpose bobbin in. So I feel like for beginners, um, I'm really into accessibility. Like I just really want you to sew and I want you to not have a lot of trouble and have fun and not try to find, start with all this crazy stuff. So just some all-purpose thread will get you there with some denim 100 needles, okay? Um, so let me see if there's any questions and then I'll keep going with some more sewing tools and then we'll jump into some hardware tools. Yeah, there was just one question from John in the chat who says, would you recommend a vintage metal domestic sewing machine? Um, so a lot of people sew with vintage metal domestic sewing machines because sewing tends to be a skill that's passed down from generations. So I've seen a lot of folks come through my classes with those and they're great machines. They're really fabulous, they last forever. There's gonna be some things you're gonna not have on them that we have on modern machines. Like sometimes you don't have a reverse or sometimes you don't have the ability to switch out the presser foot as easily as you can with a low shank snap-on foot. A lot of these older um, machines will not, you'll have to manually do that. Um, generally, you're gonna wanna make sure that machine has been serviced and taken care of. A lot of times people will inherit a machine that, and they'll start sewing on it using the same needle that has been used since 1970. So I never suggest that. And generally you just wanna get it serviced if you're gonna start using it. But all in all, the best way to tell if your machine is good for bag making is to test it on layers of fabric, on the type of fabric that you plan on sewing and see if it holds its tension and timing. Can it make a good stitch? Now, I know that, that I can go into a whole tangent on that and some folks that are joining us here have probably heard that tangent. And if you haven't, we have a free sewing 101 class on our Teachable account and there's a code and it's get sewing and you can take my whole sewing 101 class for free and I will totally thoroughly explain to you what makes a machine work well, any type of machine and if you could use it for bag making um, just because there's a lot to know about um, if a machine can actually work well for bag making in general. But we do suggest machines that have stronger motors because essentially when we're talking about heavy duty sewing, we're talking about thicker fabrics. We're talking about the ability for the needle to puncture through those fabrics, which means that the motor needs to be strong enough to do that. Any other questions? Not seeing any other questions right now, but I will, I'm gonna drop the link for the Sewing Machine 101 online class into the chat. Okay. Again, the discount code is get sewing in all caps and you can sign up for free. It's a really great resource. Can I grab some rulers? Because these are also essential tools for me. So I didn't really start getting into quilting rulers until I used to teach uh, sewing classes at a local quilting store called Modern Domestic. And that's when I got really into quilting rulers. Now I absolutely love them and I cannot sew without them. They're totally an essential tool. And for bag making, we tend to work with larger rectangles of fabric. So I really do recommend this 24 by six inch Omni Grip quilting ruler. And it has like a neon um, markings on it so it's easy to see. My favorite thing about these is the 90 degree angles that you can um, use in the corners here so they can help you shore things up or make sure that your pockets are straight and the fact that you can see through it. So that's huge with bag making because we do a lot of straight lines and we do a lot of layers of things that are almost on a grid depending on how many pockets you add or box corners you do. So this is literally like, I used to use like metal rulers with a cork back because I was just grabbing whatever rulers I had from my art studio, which is totally fine and you can get away with that. 
but you really do unlock a new level of potential if you can have rulers that really work for you for bag making and for sewing. And I really found that these do that. They also have a um, anti-slip back on them, which is super nice too. So um, this can be kind of big sometimes. So if I'm working with something small, like making a dop kit or a zipper pouch, or just getting some box corners done on a Fremont or a Maywood bag, then I would jump over to just this five inch by five inch square ruler. So these are um, things that we sell on our site too. Of course, all of my favorite sewing tools I sell on the Clumhouse site because the whole reason I sell those tools is because they really help me practice my craft a lot better. So I enjoy my craft more if I have the right tools. So we're not like necessarily going to sell every single sewing tool. Like we're not a sewing store necessarily. We just like to source our favorite bag making supplies. So the stuff that I'm talking about today is stuff that we do have on our site. So yeah, a set of quilting rulers will go a long way for you. Okay. So speaking of quilting rulers, they tend to work hand in hand with cutting mats and rotary cutters. So this is a rotary cutter from Kai Scissors. It's a Japanese um, scissor company. And I found it recently and I absolutely love it. And the reason is, is that it has a quick, like it has um, a safety that will just like reveal the, I know you guys can't see that, reveal the blade when you're cutting it, but then it'll bounce back out. So you never have an exposed blade that you can nick yourself with if it's just sitting out on your sewing table. So it's funny that I was, um, I, I have a bunch of different rotary cutters around the shop because I used to be really into the Clover rotary cutters, which are also really fabulous. But then I found Kai and I switched to Kai. Well, I had a Clover rotary cutter sitting out on my table the other day and I went to grab my ruler and I totally jammed my hand into the blade because I didn't close the safety on the blade. Well, with Kai, that's never gonna happen because the safety just automatically bounces back out. So, I mean, if you're like me, if you sew a lot or make stuff a lot, you know that, that it's easy for us to cut ourselves or prick ourselves with pins and there's always band-aids and anyways, so I just feel like this helps me not hurt myself as much. Um, the grip is really nice too. And it also has this thing on the back where you can choose if you're going through a thicker fabric, you can push this to hard. Or if you're going through a thinner fabric, you can push this to soft. So it really helps with the pressure that you need to use to cut something. So I absolutely love this rotary cutter for that. And it also comes with an extra um, cover for when you're storing it. But generally, if you're just making stuff and in the flow and you go and toss your rotary cutter out on the table, you're not gonna run your hand into it and cut yourself as easily with these. So that's really helpful. Um, Self-healing cutting mats, which I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with, but generally when we do bag making, we use scissors a lot, but we use rotary cutters with a self-healing cutting mat and a um, quilting ruler. And those three together are the magic combination for cutting really long straight lines. So that's another thing I really suggest grabbing is a self-healing cutting mat. We don't actually sell those, but um, there's a lot of different brands out there. And the ones that I like the best are the ones where the self-healing mat itself is just a little bit softer. So I don't like when it's super plasticky, which you can get some cheaper ones that are, um, I can't think of the ones, the name of the ones that I don't like, but the ones that we use in Clumhouse are by Riley Blake Design. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to say, is there another brand on there? There isn't. But yes, so you want to just make sure it's not a super slippery one where your fabric will slide around as you try and cut it. Ellie, okay. there was a question about the Kai cutter and if there's a particular size. Is there a particular size Kai cutter for leather or for wax canvas? So do the rotary cutters come in different sizes and are those good for different materials? So this type of Kai rotary cutter, I believe only comes in this 45, which is just sort of like the catch-all 
rotary cutter size. Now, when I was using Clover, sometimes I would go up to the 60, um, but really I find that I can get most things done with the 45 because that's a nice medium. Like I don't wanna ever go smaller than that. Um, but I'm not cutting like a huge amount of long lines, right? So if you wanna go larger with your rotary cutter, it would be if you're cutting really long big pieces and you just wanna get it cut a little bit quicker. But, and then for leather too, I'll use these for leather too. Great, I think that's the only question in the chat right now. Okay, so this might be, again, if you are a sewer, a stitcher, some of these tools are like, duh, I know about that tool. But like I said, this is really great essential tools. So this is a seam gauge and it really helps you find your seam allowance. And it also just helps with particular small measurements. So you really don't want a sewing studio without this. And this is just a really common sewing tool. One of my other favorite common sewing tools is thread snips. So instead of um, grabbing a large pair of scissors and setting it next to my machine and grabbing it every time I need to cut my thread, I just grab these small thread snips and they're super cute and small and easy to use and quick. Um, and then a seam ripper. So we sell this like little craft and sew set on our site, um, really inexpensive and it comes with these three essential sewing tools that are just great for any type of sewing and really good essential bag making sewing tools too. Okay, what else? Oh yeah, so this is a little bit more nuanced, but I really still want to mention it. So this is an edge stitch presser foot. Sorry, see if you all can see it there. And it has a little blade here that acts as a guide when you're sewing. So in bag making, we sew a lot of hems and a lot of uh, stitches that show in top stitches. So like for instance, on this Portsmouth tote, there's a hem right there and an edge stitch right there. And so I used an edge stitch presser foot and it runs the guide along the folded edge of the fabric and gives you a stitch that's straight in relation to the hem that you're sewing next to. So this is like a secret weapon bag making tool. Now, depending on the type of machine that you have, you might have to source this specialty, but we sell these snap-on low shank ones. And so those will most commonly work on modern Singer, Brother, Janome machines and a bunch of others too. So if your machine takes a snap-on low shank presser foot, then this will work on it. Um, sometimes sewing machines come with this presser foot, but it's actually not super common for them to come with it. But it's a really great presser foot to make bags with. We use it in every project, every bag pattern that we have. So is there any questions about sewing tools? Oh, let me talk about craft clips and pins. Yeah, no questions in the chat right now. Yeah, these are all, you know, pretty basic things, but it's nice to just get our bases covered. Okay, so these are straight pins, and this is a magnetic pin uh, plate that arranges them flat so that it's just a little bit safer. It's called a zircle. And these are flower head pins. And I really like using flower head straight pins for bag making versus other types of pins like the ball head pins or the glass head pins that you would normally use in garment making. And the reason is, is that we tend to put rulers down on top of things that we've already pinned and these are flat. So you can put a ruler down on top of this pin and still make your mark really, really easily, which is nice. Um, these are also really thicker than garment pins. So they're a little bit closer to what you would find for quilting pins. So they won't bend as easily when you're trying to pin multiple layers of thick fabric. So I really just like these flat head flower head pins <laughs> and you can find those on our site too. Now, alternatively with bag making, we use craft clips to hold thick layers of fabric together. So sometimes you just have so many layers that you just can't get a pin through that. So we use craft clips all the time. And I know that you could totally substitute with like binder clips or something like that. But 
Um, what I found with binder clips is they can leave a mark on the leather and on the wax canvas. So I really like these um, craft clips because they don't leave a mark and they hold really well and they last over time. So you just need a handful of these to start bag making. They're really great too if you want to just hold the zipper onto your project um, as you're sewing. So that's for holding things together. Now I want to talk about one other thing which is just marking tools. So these are just like really basic sewing tools that you should just have in your sewing toolbox if you're going to be bag making. My favorite pencil is a Clover Chocopel pencil. So they come in a pack of three and they come with um, a little um, pencil sharpener. And these are absolutely, I think, the best pencils to use for marking heavyweight fabric. The reason is, is they, they actually show up on dark fabric, which is great. And the chalk itself is kind of soft which you kind of need for thicker woven fabric, but it's hard enough that you still get a thin enough line. So that's super important. So I use these all the time. Now, if you want a really precise line and you wanna use some traditional type of loose chalk, I really like these too. And these are Choco pen liners and they have a little metal wheel in them here and a bunch of loose chalk here. So I always say these in, this in my classes, but the way that you open it is like this. And you never want to unscrew this or all this loose chalk will go everywhere. So one of the cool things about these is you get this like really precise thin line compared to a pencil. So you can see which one's thicker there. And you can refill these too. So you can ju buy just the refill of these and they come in a bunch of different colors. And honestly, one of my favorite things about it is the little noise that it makes when the chalk wheel spins. Like it's so satisfying to me. So there's the yellow one too. So these are my favorite marking tools. Okay. Any uh, we have a, yeah, we have a question from Venus about um, a magnetic seam guide. She says, I got a magnetic seam guide but it says not recommended for computer machines. Is it going to ruin my machine? Ooh, if it says not recommended for computer machines on the packaging, then I would say probably be careful about that. I've never seen anybody's machine be ruined by one of those in my classes, but that doesn't mean that it won't happen. Um, in my experience, I haven't seen it, but let me just say that we work on mechanical sewing machines. We don't usually work on computerized machines. Any other questions? No, nope, that's it. Okay, so now I wanna go over some leather and hardware tools and I'm gonna run and grab my rotary punch and show you that and some rivet setting tools too. I'll be right back. Okay, so if you're going to make bags, then you're probably going to end up adding rivets to things. And in order to add a rivet onto a bag, you generally need to punch a hole. So I'm going to go through on a future live stream a lot about leather and hardware. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on it right now just to get you all the basics. So there's two different ways to punch a hole. You can either use a rotary punch, which has a bunch of different sizes of holes, and you can just rotate to the hole size that you want. Or you can use a drive punch, which is just one size hole. But if you use it, and you can buy these in different sizes too. So you could buy six drive punches that would equal what this does. There's pros and cons of using either one, and I'll go over that in a second. This drive punch, if you're gonna use it, you should use it with a cutting board and with a mallet, okay? So this is a craft tool Bakelite mallet. These are mallets that we sell and I tested a lot of mallets over the years and I really like this one for the size 
and for the weight of the head and for the hardness of the surface here. So you really want to make sure when you're setting hardware or punching holes that you really transfer the force from the head of the mallet onto the drive punch into your piece of fabric so that you get that whole fabric or leather. So it's really important to use a non-rubber mallet because the mallet will just bounce off of the tools and you'll have to use so much more force to actually transfer that blow and set your hardware or punch your hole. So if I'm gonna just punch a hole in this piece of wax canvas right here. Ellie, I figured out I actually can spotlight your overhead video if you'd like me to. Oh yeah, sure. Is that, is that useful? Should I go ahead and try that? Yeah, then people can see it. Okay, spotlight video. Okay. Oh, great. So now you can see my messy work surface, which <laughs> everyone's familiar with. Um, and let me move this back a little. There we go. Okay, so we have the cutting board, my fabric here, drive punch, and a mallet. And then that's how you can get a hole in your fabric with that. Now you can also get a hole in your fabric just as easily with a rotary punch. But what a rotary punch does, it's just a lot faster in a sense where you just grab this, you don't need three different tools, but the reach for the rotary punch is only this far. So if I wanted to punch a hole in the center of a piece of fabric that was you know, towards the middle of the fabric, I would have to scrunch all the fabric into here to get that. And so that's just not that reasonable. So then we usually go to a drive punch. Now, if I'm making leather straps, this is my main go-to tool is the rotary punch because you can just get so much power out of this squeeze. And especially on this type of rotary punch, this is a rotary punch that I specially sourced. It's actually made in Germany and it has a hydraulic assist. So you don't actually have to squeeze it as hard as other rotary punches to get the same Thing to happen. So I know a lot of folks um, will have trouble with the rotary punches in general and having enough power to squeeze them. So this just really helps you. So you actually need 70% less power to make a hole with this type of rotary punch than other ones that you'll find on the market. So I really like that one for that, for that reason. Okay, so um, any questions? There are a few, yeah. Um... Let's see. Oh, question about the cutting board that you're using. And is it just a regular kitchen cutting board? Ooh, thank you so much for that question because I get that misunderstanding all of the time. So this is actually a cutting slash punching board. And this is a poly punching board. It's actually a lot thicker than what you can find in, well, some kitchen cutting boards are this thick, which is great. But generally, you are going to want to particularly source a thicker cutting board that's about a quarter inch thick. Um, and we sell these on our site. And these are just a perfect little cutting board for punching. Yeah. So I guess you could have something like this in your kitchen. But you're generally going to want to make sure whatever you use, you don't mind getting a bunch of holes into it. Because the whole purpose of this, and not to mention if you're cutting fabric or leather on your cutting board, a little bit of that gets embedded into the cutting board. So if you are gonna grab one from the kitchen, you probably wouldn't want to use it in both places. Aren't you able to also use wood? I feel like I've seen yeah, like a tree stump or something for cutting you on top of it. Definitely use wood. And again, wood doesn't self-heal in the same way that a poly cutting board would. So your surface gets chipped over time and then you don't have a nice flat surface so that your hole can sometimes not go exactly where you want it to go if the surface un is uneven underneath. Okay. Um, and then we also had a question about um, can, can you just use a hammer instead of a mallet? What's the difference there? So um, when you're hitting metal tools, you really don't want to damage the tool over time. And if you hit it with a metal hammer, it will damage the tool at the hitting end over time. Now, the other reason that I recommend a mallet instead of a hammer, and by the way, that's a great question, is um, because it doesn't, the hammer doesn't transfer the force as much as the mallet does. 
So we can go ahead and go back to my other camera if you want, Ellen. Okay. Um, so generally what we're trying to do when we are setting hardware is essentially transfer whatever blow we're putting to the hardware or the tool so that the hardware actually sets, right? So when you have a rivet, it's, um, the, it's like bigger. And when you go to set it, you're essentially crunching it down by the force, right? So if you are hitting a metal on a metal, you get this like bounce and you don't actually get this dead force being fully transferred all the way through your tool or all the way through onto your hardware. Now, having said that, I have seen a lot of people set really good hardware and punch holes with a hammer. It's totally fine to use to a certain extent. Now, when we get into tubular rivets, which I will go over in a future live talk, or we get into line 24 snaps, we really need to control the amount of force and where it's being concentrated in order to set that hardware. But if you're working with double cap rivets or your common rivet, like your jean rivet, and you're just making small holes, then you can absolutely get away with a hammer because you're not really trying to do something that needs a lot of force. So yeah, so that's a great question. Um, but I do think that as someone gets into bag making, basically getting a good mallet is sort of like a rite of passage because one of the most frustrating things about bag making is if you can't get your hardware to set. And we get so many emails about that. And the other reason that people can't set hardware is because they're working on a non-hard surface too. So we just talked about um, setting, we just talked about cutting holes, but setting hardware requires a really hard surface. So um, we have like stone slabs or anvils, but even if you have a stone slab or an anvil, it still needs to be on a non-bouncy surface. So you can't really work on your regular sewing table unless it's a really sturdy table. Um, so a lot of times people will take like a stone slab and they'll put it like on their kitchen countertop or on their concrete ground or they'll go outside and that way you won't get any bounce underneath either. Right. So it's really about isolating all of that so that it really all of the force concentrates on where you're trying to punch the hole or what hardware you're trying to set. Um, speaking of your sewing table, there was also a question about your work table there, which I know we can't really see from this camera angle, but I think the question was about um, the recommended height. Yeah, what height is your work table? And is so, it the same as your sewing table, like your cutting table versus your sewing table? That's going to really depend on how tall you are. Um, so I'm 5'8", and most of the people that I work with are 5'8 or taller. Um, and we have a cutting table that's 34 inches high. So that's been my like go-to cutting table height for the whole time that I've been professionally making bags. But I would say that if I was shorter, um, I would probably want to go down to like 33, 32 inches because you need to be able to bend over the table. So you want the table to hit you right at your waist where you can bend over it and actually reach things. Otherwise, we do have a little step stool that we pull up to the table, especially when we're using a rotary cutter, because one of the ways that's best to use a rotary cutter is if you can get your weight above the thing that you're cutting, especially if you're cutting a really long straight line. So when we used to be able to have classes before COVID, we would have little step stools for all the different students that were shorter than me, which was a lot of people because I'm kind of tall. So yeah, so 34 inches is my favorite height for a cutting table. And then your sewing table is just like standard table that you can right. sit. Which yeah. is generally 29 and a half inches high. I love that you just know that off the top of your head. <laughs> I, know, I was just thinking that. It's like, I built a lot of sewing studios yeah. for years. Just prior to Clubhouse, I had a custom bag company where I, and I lived in a bunch of different cities. And then as you all know, or maybe you don't, but when you rent an art studio in cities, they're like a lot of times really dingy. And they're just these buildings that probably aren't to code. And the only reason that they're art studios is because 
you actually aren't legally allowed to live in them. So anyways, I always have to pop up sewing studios over the years. Um, so yeah, I've probably built like 30 or 40 sewing studios in my life. <laughs> That's a future blog post, like yeah. how, to, <laughs> how to build out your studio and how to make your own cutting table and stuff like that. That would be cool to share. Um, if you mess up a rivet, how do you remove it? So we could go over that. It's not necessarily an essential tool, but it is really nice for people to know how to do it. There is going to be a future lunchtime live where the whole subject of the lunchtime live is rivets. And I would go really into depth on that. But I know that rivets and messing them up is one of the major things that people are worried about um, as they get into bag making. Um, so I wasn't planning on talking about that, but I totally can, but I have to go grab my rivet removal tool and bring it over here so I could show it to you. So I'll be right back. Let me know if you want to go to overhead for this. Yeah, one. let's go overhead. Okay. Move some of this clutter out of the way. So let's get a hole in our fabric. And let me just get a hole in my leather. Okay, and I'm just going to use a double cap rivet for this. And I'm just going to put that into my leather and hardware. I mean, leather and wax canvas. And then I'm going to go on to my hard surface, not my cutting surface, right? Because cutting boards are only for cutting tools. And a hard surface like a stone slab here is great for setting rivets. Oh yeah, I didn't mention this before, but here's a rivet setter, which you don't necessarily need to set a rivet. You could just use a hammer. Um, one of the cool things about this is it has a concave end, so it will preserve the um, look of your rivet here. So I'm going to go ahead and just hold that vertically over my rivet. Set it. So then here's a rivet that's set. And then say for some reason I, um, you know, messed this up and wanted to use a different color leather or something or forgot my washer or something, then I'm going to go ahead and grab my rivet removal tool line up the rivet to the correct place. Take the pin punch, hold it over the rivet. Oops. I'm like trying to do this and look at you guys. Okay. Let me change. Okay, so you're supposed to punch out, oops, I'm using the wrong camera. You're supposed to punch the center out. And I started punching it, but it didn't quite punch all the way yet. So then I'm gonna go ahead and go back in and do the same thing and just keep going a little bit more. 
And then now you can see that the rivet just came out. So essentially what the rivet removal tool does is it punches out the center of the rivet that's set so that it can just come off. And this is a little bit on there. Like I would get my pliers and just pop that off, but they're not over here and I don't want to run and get them, but that's what I would do here. And that removes the rivet. Now the other way that you can remove a rivet is actually with pliers. So then I would do a double set of pliers and I would pull from each end of the rivet to pull it off. So this is just a safer tool to use because when I'm pulling with my pliers, both ends of the rivet and actually picking the rivet apart, I'm using sharp tools and I'm kind of using a lot of force and it's finicky. So I just find that using the rivet removal tool, whether you're removing a double cap rivet or a tubular rivet, is just the way to go as far as safety goes. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Anne. She says, does the, does the Fremont tote use rivets? Yes. Every single bag project that we have uses rivets. So this is the Fremont tote. You're, you're back on, head on now. And there's rivets here that attach the handles. There's a rivet here that attaches the um, zipper pull. There's a rivet here that attaches the crossbody strap. Um, there's also a rivet here that reinforces the pocket. And then there's some Chicago screws on the side here. So are folks familiar with using rivets? Um, and have they had successes and failures with it? Is there more questions people have about basic rivet tools? And again, I'm not going to get super into rivets on this live stream because I have a whole hour dedicated to that coming up soon. Anne says, not at all familiar. I haven't used a rivet before, but I have set snaps, only jean rivets. Okay. Yeah, so a variety of different experiences. So double cap rivets are really similar to jean rivets. Um, and generally when you're setting a rivet, you're just trying to get the rivet stem to sort of make this almost like mushroom type shape into the cap and then it secures whatever's in between the two caps really, really well. So we use rivets in order to attach leather to our project because this leather is too thick to sew on a home sewing machine. Now sometimes you can sew through it, but it really depends on the machine that you have and a lot of machines don't love it. So in order to get a nice professional finished look, with leather, the best way to do that on a home sewing machine with non-industrial equipment is to use rivets. And once you get used to setting rivets, you really fall in love with it and you can put them on everything. Linda says, now I know why my rivets fell off of my last bag. I didn't use a hard enough surface or a wooden mallet. Yeah, so again, you could totally use a hammer and it, especially for setting rivets, you can use a hammer and it works great. But for if you have, rivets. Exactly, like for double cap rivets. But if you don't have a hard surface, then all that force you're using is just bouncing into the table and not being isolated into the rivet so that it smashes down and sets it. So even if you're hitting it from the top, if it's just going down and bouncing down, it's actually not smashing down. So you need a surface underneath the rivet that's not gonna absorb the force so that you can have it stay here and then you hit it and it actually does smash the rivet. So a lot of folks will, um, yeah, not think about what surface they're on for that. The other thing you can do when you set a rivet is just make sure that the rivet is actually denting into the leather or the fabric that you actually see it really setting in. You can also try to Pull the, pull the layers apart, right? And test it with some force to make sure that it stays in there. Yeah, and the other thing that people do is they don't vertically align their rivet when they're setting it. So you really need to make sure that when you're setting your rivet, that it stays up and down and that when you're hitting it, it's up and down. So if you have this like really bulky bag, for instance, and I'm going in and I'm finished with all my sewing and I really wanna set my rivet, and I lay it down, I need to make sure that everything 
is flat on here. I can't have like a bunch of something weird underneath there. Otherwise, I'm gonna go and hit it and the rivet's gonna set crooked and a crooked rivet is not a strong rivet. So it's really about the setup with rivets and it's really about having the right tools and equipment. And you're probably gonna get a better rivet set with a nice mallet versus um, kind of grabbing whatever you have. But you could totally set strong double cap rivets with, with just a hammer too. And I think, I think it's two weeks from today that we're going to go like really into depth on setting rivets and the different kinds of rivets, how to remove them, all the different tools you can use to set them. So if you want to learn more about that, um, yeah, I believe it's two weeks from today. Great. Thanks, Ellen. All right. Any more questions before we head off for the day? Not seeing any. Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do for you all is um, a supply sale on our site that's just exclusive for folks that joined this talk. Ellen, what are the details on that? You set that you just set that up for everyone, didn't you? Yes, so there's a discount code that we made for you guys, which is, I'll put it in the chat, but it's yay rivets, all caps, no, oh, I'm sorry, yay tools, not yay rivets, I have rivets on my mind. Yay tools, all caps, no spaces. Um, and that'll take 15% off all of our uh, tools and supplies on our website through the end of July. So you have another just over a week or so to use it. And are folks going to get this in the follow up email too? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat here. And then um, later this afternoon, I will also send a follow up email to all of you through Eventbrite with kind of a recap of some of the links that we shared today, um, a blog post from our site that gives you a good kind of recap of all of these essential tools for beginners and the discount code. Great, 15% off is great. We don't usually do a discount that high, but I also think that for you all joining here, um, I obviously you joined and spent some time with me and you're really serious about building out your bag making studio, getting the right tools in your studio. Um, so yeah, so that's just a way for us to say thank you to you. Um, the rivet removal tool is from Japan and it's made in Japan. And it is a little bit pricier because of that, because I imported it. So this is a great moment to take advantage of getting one of those because um, that's a good discount for that. Um, the other thing that I know is a little bit of a pricier tool in there is going to be the rotary punch. Um, so this is a good time to take advantage of that. And this is the one with the 70% less power needed. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. And please tune in next week and um, keep joining us and bring your questions. And I'll try and make sure to answer them all. And yeah, great hanging out with you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.